I spent my formative years as a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is a really tight-knit group with very real parameters of what is acceptable and what is not, what is true and what is not. And we believed that all the truth was on our side. My mother was not a member of that church, and it must, in retrospect, (laughs) have been horribly difficult for her to know that I, her daughter, was convinced that she would not have eternal life as I would have as a member of the one true church. And to this day, I regret the hurt that I know I inflicted on her because I chose to get married in one of the LDS temples, a place she was not allowed in because she was not a part of the group. And I deprived her of the joy of watching her daughter's wedding. We took a look at confirmation and complexity biases two weeks ago, that we tend to agree with people who agree with us, and we often prefer simple falsehoods to complex truths. And then last week, we emphasized how knowing who and whose we are gives us grounding and confidence so that we need not fear looking our biases straight in the face. And today, we're going to look at seeing as a social act where we add our own biases to the groups that we identify with and find meaning in. The first is community bias, which tells us that it is very hard to see something your own social group doesn't want you to see. And that's what I experienced in a very real way as part of the LDS church. And I thought, you know, we really are tribal. I mean, we like our self-constructed boxes of understanding. But if we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, then we need to expand our tribe to include a greater worldview. Because our tribes can, if we we don't do that, lead us into some really bad places where we totally buy into our groupthink and we learn to hate and dismiss those not thinking the way we do. Many of us grew up with the musical, South Pacific, when Lieutenant Joe Cable sang the song, you've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. That is community bias. Because when we are feeling in sync with a group, That's when our thoughts tend to flow freely. We feel safe expressing thoughts and opinions that we know will be agreed with. It's a comfortable place. But when we start to think differently from the group, thinking outside the box, we discover that our brains just sort of seem to slow down and we we slog through every thought. In fact, if you are convinced of the truth of a new idea that's not accepted by the community of which you are a part, you're going to stir up community bias in others, which will cause a disturbance, which in turn will alert the gatekeepers in the group to see you as a rebel or a troublemaker or a problem. I found that when I was in high school, and yes, I was an active member of the LDS Church, but I was also a member of other Christian groups on campus, and so I would always bring these sort of radical ideas back to the church of which I was a part. And I have to tell you, I never quite fit in because of those strange ideas I was bringing in that were outside that particular group. You know, those kinds of thoughts almost always lead to some sort of ostracism from the group that you're in, and that is really hard. But conversely, going along with a group 
going along with groupthink, when, you, when your heart tells you something else, that's really draining in its own way. And it's impossible to live with. Friends, that's the whole premise of that film or play, South Pacific. And while that film is somewhat dated when we view it today, its reality is still with us. The second social bias we see is what's called complementarity bias, in which we admit that if people are nice to us, we'll be open to what they see and have to say. And if they aren't nice to us, we won't. So we have this perception that everyone is super nice in our own groups, but can be just so mean or wrong or the new word that's in vogue these days, evil in those other groups that are out there. Complementarity bias says, if you're hostile to my ideas, I'll be hostile to yours. If you're curious and respectful to my ideas, I'll respond in kind. And we have seen this played out in a very real way over and over again in this recent election cycle. So what is the pull of your community? What is the normal dominant thought in your own circles? And perhaps think... What groups are you a part of that only allow you to say certain things in certain ways? It can be racial, religious, political, sexual orientation, gender-based, but I am guessing that you are all part of at least one and probably many groups that help you establish the biases from which you act. So we really do need to examine carefully the third and perhaps most significant social bias, which is contact bias, which says that if you, lacked con if you lack contact with someone, you won't see what they see. Because we begin to change how we see when we have relationships with people of a different group when we open our hearts to them, when we begin to see that things that we have always thought or assumed just aren't true. And it's then that we often find ourselves at odds with our community group. I have to tell you that I have a lot of personal examples of the times when I have taken the time to develop relationships with people who have changed my mind about stances and absolutes in my own life. When my children were younger, for instance, their Sunday school teachers were a lesbian couple, and at the same time, there were two gay men in the choir who participated in the children's music ministry with love and compassion and grace. The four of them were Christians in the fullest sense of the word, and I could no longer envision them as condemned by God. I interacted and learned from brothers and sisters, from different racial and ethnic, ethnic groups, and came to discover that life just wasn't the same for them as it was for me. And opening my eyes to that has been profound. And that continues to this day. Moving from that closed enclave of the Mormon church to this open minds, open hearts, open doors mantra of United Methodism opened a whole new world for me. But it closed the door on many deep and lasting, long-lasting relationships from those who were convinced that I was now going to hell or at least selling myself so short that I wouldn't enter the highest kingdom of heaven along with them. I have wrestled to overcome contact bias in my relationship with colleagues and friends with transgender children, with those in poverty, with those who are in or just out of prison who are finding it difficult to have a good life because of all the obstacles in their way, even, dare I say it, contact 
with those of a different political affiliation. And I'm still learning and growing and discovering. And we see all of those things at work in our Bible passage today. We see this transformation of Nathaniel from a naysayer to a Jesus follower in a matter of moments as he confronts and overcomes some of the community, complementarity, and contact biases in his own life. When we first meet Nathaniel, we see that he seems to approach life with a rather critical lens, biases, if you will, a, a master of suspicion. His friend says, we found the man about whom Moses and the prophets wrote. Nathaniel doubts it, rationalizing, remember, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Jesus greets him generously as a man in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel is suspicious. Where did you get to know me? Nathaniel is certainly caught up in his own biases, his own way of seeing the world and the people in it. So when this guy, who tends to see the negative, effuses this overwhelmingly positive declaration of who Jesus is after just meeting him, we do well to ask, what's going on here? The drama in this story counts on the fact that this character, Nathaniel, doesn't tend to act in this sort of effusive, positive manner. He does not declare false positives. So if Nathaniel, of all people, confesses faith in Jesus, you can trust him, right? Because he is not predisposed to change his mind on the spot. No, his contact with his friends and then with Jesus is what eliminates whatever suspicions he had. And I love this because it really surprises him as well. He's actually quite startled when the reality of Jesus snaps unexpectedly into focus. There's something you see about this fig tree remark that makes it clear for Nathaniel just who Jesus is. Now, the reader of John's gospel doesn't get to be privy to exactly what transformed Nathaniel's view of Jesus, but what is clear is that epiphanies of the Christ come to different people in such drastically different ways that it can even be incomprehensible, which is why you need to listen and to see from another's point of view, to see that your way is not the only way to see. This text is an epiphany. Epiphanies tend to transform people. This is seen, seen in Nathaniel's change and in an epiphany-induced change that Martin Luther King Jr. describes in his book, Stride Toward Freedom, where he writes, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready 
to face anything. Martin Luther King Jr. was changed by this epiphany, often referred to as his vision in the kitchen. Nathaniel's epiphany, and when he suddenly could see clearly who Jesus was, changed Nathaniel. And we all have our own epiphanies, where we see clearly for the first time something that we have either refused or just couldn't see before. And we, like Martin, like Nathaniel, are invited to come and see more deeply, more openly than we are wont to do, being ready to face anything because God walks at our side. As we celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. this week, it is worth noting that Nathaniel had to get past his prejudice about people from Nazareth before he could follow Jesus. Just as Philip insisted that Nathaniel meet Jesus, friends can insist that others step past their prejudices to meet others. And that, that's the job of the church. You and I are called to examine our biases closely and learn to listen to the voices of others in the world, some of whom may just not agree with us. You remember those four principles proposed by Harry Dressler that we talked about in our first week of the series? Embodying humility, suspending judgment, expressing curiosity, and holding possibility? Well, the same spirit who descended upon Jesus at baptism is still working among us, encouraging us to live and embody those very same principles. And so we pray together this day, come Holy Spirit, that we may see and taste the grace of God afresh. Come Holy Spirit, that we may share the grace of God with others. Come Holy Spirit, that we might bear witness with our whole lives to the grace of God made manifest and available to us in Jesus, as we learn to see others just as he sees them. Amen.